Well, I want to thank everybody for the, uh, showing up this morning and congratulate Aaron for a feat of technical excellence of getting this going. Uh, I am uh, happy to share with you a little bit today about some of the work being done on pediatric moya moya around the world. I thought just to start, even though we're all a bunch of neurosurgeons, this question, you know, what is moya moya? Uh, because this comes up a lot in the meetings. So I thought I'd go to the most definitive source I could imagine. And uh, I went to Wikipedia and, uh, you know, this is what people are reading on the, on the Internet. And uh, the Wikipedia definition is that uh, moya moya is a disease in which certain arteries in the brain are constricted. And they're not wrong, I guess. Um, you know, uh, sort of by definition, moya moya is just rare. But I, but I think increasingly recognized, especially here in the States, cause of pediatric stroke which is characterized by this chronic progressive narrowing of the internal carotid arteries, and then that leads to ischemia. While the clinical course is variable, um, this is often unrelenting and can result in death of children if they have continued stroke burden. It was first described in 1957 as hypoplasia of the bilateral internal carotids, and the name Moya Moya was introduced in 1969 by Suzuki and Takaku. Um, I, one thing that I think is important, particularly in the pediatric population, is differentiating between this idea of Moya Moya disease and Moya Moya syndrome. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, Moya Moya affects all ages, but historically has a peak between uh, younger children at about age five and then young adults in their 40s. Um, traditionally, females are more commonly affected uh, compared to males, uh, but you'll see that this is not always the case in certain subsets of the disease. Um, there is a geographic prevalence to this, and about three per 100,000 children in Japan are affected compared to a reported one in a million in the U.S., but I think that number is actually a lot higher, uh, and I'll talk about that again in a second. Um, there are ethnic differences. Uh, those of Asian ancestry are more commonly affected, and Probably this is due to one of the more common gene mutations uh, than a higher number of African-American uh, ancestry, and we think this is related to sickle cell disease, and then seems to be less common in people of Hispanic background. The diagnosis is made, at least currently, uh, on the basis of clinical and radiographic findings, including this characteristic narrowing of the internal carotids with collateral development in more advanced cases. And this is a nice picture from the child's nervous system a few years ago showing this puff of smoke uh, I, I don't know what the radiologists in the 60s in Japan were doing, but apparently they were smoking a lot of something when they saw this comparison, but uh, this is what you can see here. The differential diagnosis, at least in kids, you think about uh, cerebral arterial dissection, uh, focal cerebral arteriopathy, which does get better with time, or this reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, uh, arteritis and vasculitis. Um, there are some fake outs that are important to think about, in particular, Patients that have anemia, uh, especially the sickle cell patients, if they're looked at on an MRA, uh, the MRA can falsely overcall the degree of stenosis on the carotid arteries. So it's important if you get an MRA, particularly in anemic patients after a trauma, uh, if they have sickle cell disease, for example, make sure that the anemia is corrected before you get the MRA. Uh, we look at flare changes a lot here at Boston Children's for ischemia, but if children are getting propofol as part of sedation for an MRI, uh, they'll get false positive IV sign, this slow flow, which I'll show again in a few seconds. And then after angiogram, sometimes kids can have vasospasm. So if there's any question about this, you need to speak to your angiographer. Traditionally, the original diagnoses were made radiographically, where on a lateral angiogram, this uh, Suzuki grading system, starting with a normal angiogram, Suzuki 1 to 2, where you have this narrowing, just like if you have arteries on a highway, uh, where the roads get narrow and parts of the brain are not well perfused. Then you have this Suzuki 3, 4, which is this classic moya moya, these collaterals. And the analogy is just like if a major road is shut down, uh, other side roads are taken and those tinier side roads get congested and swollen and that's exactly what you're seeing with this collateral development. And lastly, it gets completely burnt out. So here at Children's, we joke that this is like a normal human being. This is like a neurosurgeon. This is like a neurosurgery attending with bad circulation. This is like an orthopedic surgeon who we joke in the U.S. are not too bright and they don't have great circulation. Um, this radiographic diagnosis has been supplemented over the years with pathologic and proteomic diagnoses, uh, 
lot of nice work has been done at many institutions to show that um, really what's happening is this overgrowth of smooth muscle cells. So unlike uh, atherosclerotic disease where there's a plaque inside, um, unlike vasculitis where there's inflammation in the wall, this is actually smooth muscle cell overgrowth. This is caught inside, which is why we put the kids on aspirin, and then they're living off this tiny lumen. We've also found a lot of inflammatory and ischemic proteins, which are upregulated uh, in these children. I think that's important for understanding why the therapies we use work. The biggest revolution, obviously, <clears throat> has been in the past decade or so, understanding the genetic underpinnings. And uh, I mentioned earlier that there's a syndrome and there's a disease. I think what historically has been called Moya Moya uh, in reality is probably dozens of different arteriopathies that share a final common end radiographic pathway. Some of these that were first described are the ACTA2 mutations, which uh, are originally found in a group of people with uh, aortic disease. But the common theme in these ACT2 mutations are mutations in the actin, uh, the motility proteins of uh, smooth muscle cells. Um, in some patients with a certain type of mutation will affect their aorta, and in another subset it will give them an intracranial abnormality, and this is the R179 mutation. Uh, the big find, obviously, in 2011 was RNF213. This is this mysterin uh, protein, which is an ATPase. And uh, this is very common, taking up about 10 to 15 percent of uh, Asian-related Moya Moya. Uh, and about 90 percent of those familial cases may carry this RNF213 mutation. So this is a really big finding uh, and, and plays into the fact that, uh, if you look on the side, these multiple other genetic-based arteriopathies neurofibromatosis, uh, the BRCA gene, the, uh, the Gucci gene, uh, so many different subgroups, which I really think share a common pathway. As I mentioned, this is sort of the arteriographic progression where that smooth muscle cell disease that affects the initial branching of the arteries as they enter into the base of the skull, where they have the thickest layer of these smooth muscle cells, is where the disease exists. It sort of results, as I mentioned, this progression through collateral. You can see how they're living off this very tiny lumen, which is why we are so focused on keeping the children hydrated, avoiding hypotension, and giving them platelet-inhibiting agents, for example, like aspirin, to reduce this clot formation over time. And this begs the question, is all Moya Moya the same? And, and as I mentioned previously, you know, uh, not only is all Moya Moya the same, but is pediatric Moya Moya the same as adult? Should we just keep common neurosurgeon on? I think all of us who treat kids would probably answer no. Moya Moya is not the same. This is a picture of Naren as a young man. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but I think those of us that treat kids understand that, that children are not the same as adults. And this is reflected in the pathology that we see. Um, if we look at the presentation, for example, of Moya Moya, uh, it is different in children than in adults. Um, Moya Moya makes up about all, 6% uh, of all pediatric strokes after the neonatal period uh, in the U.S. And unlike adults, pediatric Moya Moya tends to present much more commonly with ischemic symptoms like uh, completed stroke or transient ischemic attacks, in contrast to the uh, much higher hemorrhagic rate of Moya Moya in adults, which we think is due to a combination of longer standing, higher blood pressure in adults compared to kids, and perhaps the higher rate of smoking, both of which contribute to microaneurysm formation in adults, leading to more common bleeding events in adults compared to kids. So they present differently. Um, another thing I think which is very important are these subgroups and uh, originally described here, I think where we have more of a heterogeneous population in the U.S. Uh, than in Japan, Korea, or China. Um, what we found is that um, there are many different subgroups, very distinct subgroups of disease, and this has been reflected in some of the European work as well. Uh, we've seen a large number in kids with neurofibromatosis type 1, kids who have had previous radiation for brain tumors, for example, cranial radiation, kids with Down syndrome, uh, and then in particular, kids with congenital cardiac anomalies, structural midline uh, vascular anomalies, which I mentioned, and then sickle cell disease. So I do think one of the take homes and the important things, at least in our group here, is this idea of when do we screen patients, and particularly in the pediatric population with these at-risk groups, uh, how do we engage our non-neurosurgical colleagues, because they're on the first line for uh, identifying these kids, and then the importance of evidence-based 
data based data for driving management of these kids. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, some important subgroups that are uh, both unique, I think, uh, to the US and European population, uh, but also highlight the need for screening, uh, in particular sickle cell, neurofibromatosis, and Down syndrome, or trisomy 21s. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we do our screening here in the US. Um, and then I think a controversial area is how we manage asymptomatic patients. What are the indications for treatment? And, and these are some controversies that come up here. I thought it'd be helpful to review them a little bit. So obviously screening is controversial and, and there are some subsets I think that highlight when and how screening can be a helpful tool. Uh, in particular, the US, we have sickle cell disease. Why, why am I mentioning this? Well, about 400,000 people in the US have sickle cell disease. It's also prevalent in groups in Europe and in Africa. Um, about 10% of all kids that have sickle cell disease will suffer a stroke before age 20. So this is a big problem. And about 43% of those that have a stroke will have some radiographic finding that at least looks like an arteriopathy similar to Moya Moya. And about half of those will continue to have strokes despite optimal medical management, meaning exchange transfusions. So this is telling us that of this 400,000 population, there's a huge number, probably a couple of thousand people that are getting treatments for sickle cell disease to abrogate stroke and are not getting the right treatment and they're gonna be medical treatment failures. So the key question I think is how do we find the right candidates for surgical treatment for Moya Moya. And we've published on this, as have other groups. Um, what we've shown, and, and the natural history group have shown in the sickle cell group here, is that without surgical treatment, there's a stroke rate of about 66% within a five-year window. So a pretty high rate of stroke. Um, and yet with surgical revascularization, particular to sickle cell and Moya Moya, we can drop that stroke rate down to about 5.5% over five years, incorporating the perioperative risk. So I think we can really change the natural history here. And uh, basically what we found is that if we screen the sickle cell patients with transcranial Dopplers, just to look at their uh, rate of flow, um, for those kids that have elevated transcranial Dopplers, uh, over 200 centimeters per second in the middle cerebral, if that doesn't drop after exchange transfusions, those folks are the folks that we should screen with an MRI, MRA, and a high number of those will have a Moya Moya-like arteriopathy. So I think this is really boiled down to some evidence-based screening here in the U.S., and our hope is this will impact and reduce uh, the stroke rate by surgical revascularization. This is a couple of thousand kids, we think. Another big group are the children with neurofibromatosis type 1. Why are we looking at this? Well, in the U.S., NF affects about 1 in 3,500 kids. So it's a large number of patients. And about 5% of those will have some radiographic evidence of an arteriopathy that at least looks like Moya Moya, this Moya Moya syndrome. And so we ask, you know, what are some risk factors? There's such a huge number of these kids. Who can we predict might have Moya Moya? And what we found are those kids that have a younger age, particularly under age 5, uh, if they have a known uh, optic uh, glioma, uh, and if they've previously had cranial radiation, which is not done much here in the U.S. anymore, but we have this sort of lag population that's catching up, these are risk factors for the Moya Moya arteriopathy in conjunction with NF1. We also then asked, you know, how does this syndromic Moya Moya of NF1 compare to so-called regular Moya Moya, the, the, for example, the RNF213 mutation? And what we found that is similar is that NF and the non-syndromic, they both present at about the same age, about six or seven years old. There is a higher uh, ratio of females compared to males. Uh, their presentation of the type of symptoms they have are uh, very similar. They both present with TIAs or strokes, so ischemic. Uh, there's no increase in the rate of hemorrhage. Imaging looks the same. It's pretty much indistinguishable on angiogram or MRI. The surgical complication rates remain low and similar in both groups. And importantly, both groups usually have good responses to surgery. What's different with the NF group is that there is a far higher likelihood of unilateral presentation, especially if you exclude the post-radiation patients. About 50% of NF patients are unilateral compared to about a third of the, of the spontaneous patients. We have more asymptomatic patients in the NF group, so it's found as part of screening for their NF, where they may have uh, silent strokes, 
but they don't necessarily have clinical symptoms. Um, and for sure, the patients that have had radiation are much higher risk, both of getting bilateral moya moya, but also of being surgical candidate risks. And we also have published evidence that in the NF group in particular, that these kids do progress over time, which I think uh, leads to the idea of surgical revascularization. And again, I'll talk about this in a second. A recent group we've looked at are these kids with mid-aortic or renal artery stenosis. And I think these kids are important because they'll present with um, either uh, hypertension or they come to attention of your pulmonary or your uh, uh, cardiac colleagues because of the uh, aortic stenosis. And this group has made up a fairly significant proportion of our overall syndromic kids in the U.S. And we were curious if there is a genetic underpinning to this sort of cohort of patients. And we published just this past year that, in fact, two very interesting groups of patients shook out from this. Those kids with mid aortic stenosis, what we found is that the kids that also had the moya moya arteriopathy had a very high rate of mutations in the NF1 gene. Uh, they often had Allergeal syndrome, which we published before, or Williams syndrome. And they commonly had mutations, as I mentioned, the NF1 gene or in Jagged. In contrast, there was a very interesting group that had mid aortic stenosis that did not have the arteriopathy, and they had a non moya moya RNF213 gene, which is very interesting be because quiet. it suggested the same pattern of uh, RNF213 that controls blood vessel disease, may do it in the head with some mutations for moya moya, and may do it in the chest with others. And this is showing sort of a common pathway, which is uh, interesting genetically. Another group of the Down syndrome kids. So um, we've known for a long time there's this association, and in fact, moya moya is about 26-fold times more common in kids with Down syndrome than in kids without Down syndrome. So there's clearly a genetic predisposition here with this trisomy 21. I think one of the big problems with Down syndrome kids is that it's probably a combination of their cognitive delay, which is variable in the children, of course, but it can make it harder for them to report uh, stroke symptoms. And the second issue being that many of these Down syndrome kids, in keeping with this common theme of midline vascular disease, the Downs kids often have cardiac disease. And if they do get a stroke, there's a tendency to sort of acknowledge the stroke as a cardiac embolic event and not properly diagnose it as moya moya. The consequence of this sort of absence of awareness is that um, Down syndrome kids are usually diagnosed at an older age, almost three years older than the non-Downs moya moya. They more commonly have a stroke or a fixed deficit at presentation, almost 90% of them compared to about two-thirds of the non-moya moya. And radiographically, almost all of the Downs kids without moya moya will have radiographic evidence of stroke, completed stroke, on their imaging at diagnosis compared to just about half in the non moya moya group. So I think we're doing a disservice by diagnosing these kids late. I think being aware of the disease is very important. So with that, with these groups, any group for moya moya, NF, Down syndrome, uh, you know, cardiac disease, but really any kid, the question comes up if you suspect moya moya, how do you evaluate them? And the diagnostic evaluation and the management in kids that we use here at Boston Children's is a little different, I think, than some other centers around the country and the world. Um, like many folks, we rely very heavily on MRI and MRA as an initial screening test to look for ischemia or a stroke. And in rare cases, we use arterial spin labeling to get a sense of flow. I think one of the big differences we have is we rely very heavily on axial flare imaging. You can see this bright signal in the sulci here, which goes away after surgery. This is the so-called IV sign. We find this to be a very reliable and reproducible uh, anatomic marker of ischemia, which we think is not only easier for uh, the kids, because it's the same study than adding on a perfusion study, for example, like Diamox, um, they don't get the radiation of the diamond studies, and on top of which, uh, it's anatomic specific, so we can see what part of the brain is affected and monitor that postoperatively on a single study. So this is something we do quite a bit here, and I think it's been very helpful in the pediatric population because it minimizes testing, it's anatomic specific, and it reduces um, uh, costs for the kids. Um, we start all the children on aspirin uh, unless they have a specific allergy because of the reasons I mentioned earlier for uh, thrombus-related disease. Uh, 
and we get multidisciplinary consultations for the syndromic cases. A big question that comes up in the US is, hey Ed, do you need to do catheter angiography with six vessel injection? Um, our published risk is less than 1%, but we get this question, why are you doing catheter angiograms? Do we need them in moi moi patients? It costs a lot of money, it takes time, and there's risk to doing the procedure even if it's low. And so we looked at this, and the big answer that we've had is that the idea of these transdural collaterals, um, essentially vessels that have grown spontaneously from branches of the external carotid, whether they are in the scalp or whether they're in the dura. And you can see here, for example, these middle meningeal vessels are providing a great deal of frontal blood supply in the cortex and some parietal blood supply here. And, and these transdural collaterals are important because if you're doing a craniotomy here for your moya moya, direct, indirect, whatever, if you interrupt these transdural collaterals, you're gonna reduce or you're gonna increase the risk of a stroke elsewhere. <clears throat> and you say, well, why don't you just preserve the dura on all of them? And some people do that. Uh, our personal feeling is that it's important to expose as much cortex as possible to open the arachnoid and allow the cortex to get ingrowth of vessels for indirect procedures. So we do want to open the dura widely when we can, and we want to be cognizant of this in planning our craniotomy. <clears throat> we quantified this. We looked at uh, 358 hemispheres just in the past couple of years. Um, of these 324, we treated with surgery, and what we found is that about a quarter of these uh, children, of these hemispheres, had transdural collaterals within the surgical field, which means they were at risk of damage if we didn't know about them. We found that in our cohort of these patients, uh, about 4% uh, of the kids would have a stroke, and that almost half of these, 42%, we could relate directly to interrupting a transdural collateral. So what this is saying is that essentially half of our perioperative complications could be reduced or, or obliterated if we just made care to preserve these vessels. So I think this is a very important practice management. The other thing we saw is that the evidence of these transdural collaterals indicated the patients that had the best surgical response. So at one year post-op, these angiograms showed that the ones, the kids that had transdural collaterals pre-surgery had the best results with the highest Matsushima grades or ingrowth post-surgery. So essentially these, these brains are brains that are primed to grow blood vessels, like a crystal ball that tells us the future. Overall, transdural collaterals are present in nearly half of all moya moya patients when we look carefully. Um, they're more common in advanced disease, so the worse the ischemia, the more common that transdural collaterals are present. They are associated with stroke as a perioperative complication, which is avoidable and I think important, and it may suggest increased capacity to produce surgical collaterals postoperatively. So this is basically why we continue to do uh, angiograms. We've looked at CT, uh, we've looked at thin cut, high resolution CT angiogram, and it just doesn't provide the same level of detail that the catheter angiograms do at least have yet. So this is why we do our evaluation. Now suppose you've done the evaluation and you find some asymptomatic kids. Um, you know, the big question with this is you've got a kid, they're perfectly fine, they've never had clinical disease, you know, in terms of symptoms, ischemic attacks, etc. should you treat them? Uh, you know, the, the, the natural history, if you have a kid that comes in with symptomatic moya moya with multiple TIAs, multiple strokes, it's easy to suggest to the family that you should operate. I think what's harder is that these asymptomatic patients, which is much more rare, although we're finding it more and more as we're using more MRIs, there's very little data to guide decision making. Should you take this normal kid and, and should you put him or her through surgery? And that's a harder question. So we looked at this and basically we had 83 patients where at some point in the past, we had a totally normal scan. So no arteriopathy for sure. What we found is we followed these kids, they were getting scanned for other reasons. They had had a trauma, sickle cell disease that they were being followed for, NF1 for example. That the kids that went on to develop Moya Moya, um, again, sort of a similar population, about nine years old, more commonly female than male, and we followed them for about five years so we could get a sense as to when Moya Moya developed. We sort of defined radiographic progression, so when these kids get worse, in three ways. So first, um, did they develop an arteriopathy? So they had normal blood vessels at some point in the past, and then on these follow-up images, they developed this moya-moya-like arteriopathy according to the Japanese guidelines. 
The second idea for progression was evidence of this IV sign, this flare, sulcal brightness, as I've shown you before. And then the third would be evidence of a new radiographic infarction on MRI. So that's how we defined when these kids progressed. And so if we took these asymptomatic moya moya kids, what we found is about half of the kids progressed within five years radiographically. So this is not a static disease. This gets worse. More importantly, <clears throat> What we found is he said, all right, well, which of these findings is your crystal ball? Which is your predictor of when is something bad going to happen? And what we found is that if you did not have this IV sign at some point in the past, and then you developed it, there is a short window, about a year and change, before they will get a stroke. So this is your red flag. If you're following a patient and you're not sure whether to operate or not, if they were asymptomatic and they developed the IV sign, generally we use that as our trigger to operate. Clinically, these kids also, if you're asymptomatic, they will develop clinical symptoms. About half will develop symptoms, headache, stroke, seizure, et cetera, within, a, uh, about, uh, within that five-year follow-up. So the take-home message here, I think, which is important, is that even if you have an asymptomatic moi moi kid, so you see it on imaging, but they have no clinical symptoms, almost half the kids will progress clinically or radiographically within a five-year window. In particular, if they have the slow cortical flow as evidenced by IV sign, that's your trigger that operative intervention is definitely, in our opinion, a good idea. And I think that this data supports the more aggressive use of surgical revascularization in the asymptomatic population to reduce the risk of subsequent stroke. And this has now been incorporated in our American Heart Association guidelines here in the US that just came out last month. So I think this is important. What is the end result for indications in kids? What are we using in our practice and what are the AHA guidelines here in the US? Well, basically our evidence-based indications for surgery, if you have angiographic or MRI evidence of Moya Moya, Suzuki stage two to six with ID sign on flare, if the children are medically stable for the OR, so they're not horribly ill, and if they, and this includes asymptomatic patients, we would recommend surgical intervention. We would not perform surgery on a child that is neurologically devastated. Um, so if they have no hope of regaining function, they've got horrible brainstem strokes or bilateral infarcts to the point where they're ma massively debilitated. If they have Suzuki 1, where it's indeterminate disease, they have no IV sign and no symptoms, those are kids that we would probably watch. And if it's an unclear diagnosis, whether you're worried about a focal cerebral arteriopathy or arteritis, uh, many times we'll get a repeat study in a short window or for example, uh, an MRA with contrast, looking at thin vessel wall imaging can help us with this arteritis question or dissection compared to moya moya. Um, I would comment that in general, if you've had a fresh, large stroke, we'll often wait about six weeks or so to let that cool down before surgery. But the bottom line is we're very aggressive, and as we say here in the US with Nike, just do it. Uh, I really think that the, the evidence supports that this is an aggressive bad disease, and that surgical revascularization can really change the natural history and help these kids out. So if we do decide to treat the kids, the question is, how do we treat them? What is the surgery that we do? <clears throat> so before surgery, people ask about medical therapy. Um, in the past, steroids have been tried at different times. Uh, I really think this is not indicated. The sugar imbalances that happen uh, can actually make things worse. So we're very against the idea of steroids in these kids. Um, anticoagulants are used from time to time and antiplatelet agents. Um, we usually start with baby aspirin at low dose, as I mentioned, and if needed, we'll add an anticoagulant like Plavix. Um, people have tried calcium channel blockers in the past with the idea that they vasodilate the tiny vessels in the brain, and this may help with headache management and flow. We've had some limited success with this. I would comment that obviously if they're used with too large of a dose, the vasodilation can cause blood pressure drops systemically, and that's bad. So if this is used, it needs to be done very carefully with a slow ramping up uh, and being cautioned not to lower blood pressure. <clears throat> that's medical management. Surgically, as you all know, the idea this is kind of like a highway. So this is Boston where I live, a little local flair for the morning here or the afternoon, wherever you are. And if this is Boston, there's a major highway that comes up into Boston. Uh, and sometimes that highway is clogged. 
So just like with Moya Moya, if the internal carotid is clogged and the main root is, is no good, what we try to do is find a different root where we can get around Boston uh, and we'll take an external branch and use that to fill the brain. So that's the general strategy, as all of you know. Um, the bottom line is that you have direct bypass, uh, where you sew one vessel into another, and indirect. With direct, the big advantage is you get immediate perfusion. Uh, blood will get into the brain right away, but it can be technically challenging, especially in tiny kids with small vessels. It does require clamping time, which can lead to focal ischemia, and uh, it may only just revascularize a small section of the brain. In contrast, indirect procedures, which are much more commonly used in kids, have the major shortcoming that they take weeks, sometimes months, to fully perfuse the brain. So you're waiting on time. On the flip side, it's on the plus side, it's simpler surgery. You can revascularize as much of the brain as you want. Stenoses are not an issue. There's no clamping time. And you can have a much broader area of revascularization. <clears throat> so there are pros and cons to both. This can be a difficult decision. Uh, this is our operating room here in Children's trying to figure out what's what. But when we look at the data objectively, one of another group did a very nice meta-analysis looking at over 4,000 cases. And essentially with five and 10 year post-op follow-up, the bottom line is that in the pediatric population, certainly the, the data would suggest that indirect procedures are probably of greater utility with greater protection over time. And this is, uh, I'll follow evidence by another group that says, at least in younger children, that um, most likely indirect procedures are the treatment of choice. Now, the surgical procedures have been getting better and better for a number of new tools have come out uh, for direct bypass, this cut flow index, which has been championed by Fatty Chabelle and Sepia Minhanjani at the University of Chicago, uh, University of Illinois in Chicago have done a, an amazing job helping to match uh, blood supply to blood demand, which has reduced post-operative complications in this direct bypass. Fluorescein obviously has been around for over a decade now and is really wonderful for direct bypass. And even as simple as using resorbable sutures um, is very helpful because frankly, the kids cry when you pull the stitches out or the staples out after. And if you use dissolvable stitches, while it's not very glamorous, I think it really reduces the kids having to come in. They don't cry, it reduces the stroke risk. So that's been a big help. Not all advances are glamorous in managing these kids. Um, <clears throat> we have protocol-driven care at our hospital. Every kid that comes in, we have a set rule. All the nurses, all the physicians follow the same rule. Um, it's how we admit them preoperatively. We have them come in the night before surgery for hydration so that they don't get dehydrated when they're NPO before surgery. Um, we keep them on their aspirin right through surgery, taking it even the day before. Um, we use... Um, EEG monitoring, uh, which we think is very helpful. This is originally from the uh, carotid uh, literature for, uh, uh, you know, uh, atheromas and, and carotid bypass um, in the past. And this has been very helpful in Moya Moya surgery to identify slowing during the operation so that we can reduce the risk of intraoperative uh, stroke. So how do we actually do the surgery? <clears throat> so I've got a little video I'm going to show in just a second, but I want to really make uh, you know a call out to my mentor, Mike Scott, and Aaron mentioned him earlier. He's been an incredible uh, leader and mentor for me. Um, there have been many variations of uh, the original um, uh, synangiosis and, and EDAS, uh, forwarded by many folks in the Japanese literature, uh, Dr. Matsushima and Dr. Uh, uh, you know, the, the whole group, but essentially you take a branch of the superficial temporal artery, you turn a craniotomy flap here where it comes in and out, and you replace the bone flap, and over time these blood vessels will grow in. The variation we use at Children's, and I'll show the video in just a second, differs in two important ways. First, we use peel sutures, with the idea being that if we hold the blood vessel in apposition to the brain with heartbeats, with movement, that blood vessel stays stuck to the brain and it makes it easier for new blood vessels to grow in without spinal fluid and disruption. The second thing which I think is important is we do a wide arachnoidal opening. It doesn't add a lot of time to the surgery, but I think what it does is it removes a mechanical barrier to ingrowth and it also promotes all of the growth factors and the ischemic factors that are fertilizers to stimulate blood growth to get from the subarachnoid space to the donor vessels. And also when the vessel is touching the brain without the arachnoid there, those membrane bound blood, uh, blood vessel growth factors can interact much better without the arachnoid as a barrier. So that's the reason we do it. <clears throat> 
In terms of the surgery, uh, this is a little video. We don't use uh, pins here. So we put the head on a donut. We don't pin the child. This is our EEG lead protocol. We map out the superficial temporal artery with a Doppler, usually the parietal branch. And then under the microscope, we'll open the distal end first. Uh, now we use this more with a bipolar actually to go faster as opposed to using a blade. We dissect from the vertex down to the ear so that if there's any problems or branches, we can address them. We'll take the side branches here with bipolar electrocautery and micro scissor or a bovi, but we do leave a cuff around the vessel. And the purpose of leaving that cuff is it allows ingrowth to come in. We found with our laboratory studies that most of the growth comes from the edge of the blood vessel. So if you, you don't want to strip all the adventitia off. We lift it up off the temporalis muscle here and we leave that cuff of uh, material, as you can see, on the undersurface. We make a big galial, subgalial opening as wide as we can, anterior and posterior. We use these lone stars to reflect it. And we divide the temporalis into quadrants, the idea being the bigger opening you have, the more brain you can expose for indirect. Uh, we turn a burr hole at the top and the bottom of the arteries to get very nervous when the resident is drilling. Um, we uh, try to preserve vessels when necessary. When we don't have to, we open the dura as widely as we can, make multiple pie-shaped wedges. The idea being we use that dura with the middle meningeal branches as evidence of growth. Um, under the scope, we'll use a Greishaber blade, a tiny arachnoid knife, and we'll spend five or 10 minutes carefully opening up the arachnoid. Uh, we will do this typically to start over the sulci of the vessels, as you see here. And again, we'll use micro scissors, we'll use jeweler's forceps, we'll use a Greishaber blade, but really opening this up quite a bit. Uh, this tends to be safer to open over the sulci um, because the brain is often very injected and trying to uh, open over the sort of raw surface of the brain here can lead to bleeding. So we can be very careful about that and see how that plays out. Um, then we'll use 10 -0 nylons, uh, which we'll put uh, a couple of stitches in from the peel surface to the soft tissue of the artery. And I would comment that during this time, we'll often see some slowing on the EEG, and we will use propofol, for example, uh, as a neuroprotective agent. And what that will do is it will reduce uh, the cerebral demand, and then that can shunt blood to the part of the brain that needs it to add the protective effect. We'll put in several of these 10 nylon sutures. And the idea, again, as I mentioned, is just by tying this down, we keep the blood vessel in apposition to the brain. So with every heartbeat, it stays in place. And we try to get it over the sulci, as you can see, exactly where we opened. Try to span the sylvian fissure so we get both the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe. And then we put the dura back. We don't close it. We let the peel vessels grow in from the dura. Put a piece of gel foam over the site. Uh, no thrombin because that increases spasticity. We close the temporalis muscle in the horizontal plane, but not the vertical, uh, so because that, that's the way the muscle chews. So that's how we do our synangiosis. You've all seen direct bypasses before. Uh, we're big fans of using fluorescein so we can demonstrate that the bypass is patent. And then ultimately, we'll see that it will fill uh, the brain and fill across the fissure. So when we do direct bypasses, which in fairness is the minority of what we do at Children's, um, we do use fluorescein. How does this all play out? What is the result of all the work? <clears throat> well, um, angiographically, the kids do very well. About 90% will have Matsushima grade A or B postoperatively on angiogram. Although we're getting into a new grading system, we're looking at the uh, degree of cortex filled from both native and grafted population, and we'll hopefully have that published within the next year, which I think we're gonna be leaning more towards that in Matsushima grades. Um, in terms of clinical outcomes, the kids do very well. Um, over 98% of the kids are stable or improved over time, despite the fact that their native moya moya is getting worse. So this suggests that surgery is changing the natural course of the disease, and we show that the stroke rate grow, goes down from 66 to 90 percent without surgery, down to about four and a half percent over five years with surgical revascularization. Um, we've published this just showing that the blood vessel is growing really well. This is an elegant paper uh, by Mike Scott, just showing a timeline. This is before surgery with multiple little dots every time they have a stroke. This is when surgery happened. This is followed for months or years after. You can see this profound reduction 
in strokes. And this, I think, just visually really shows the impact of surgery and changing the natural history of this disease. Radiographically, the kids do great. Uh, you can see how these blood vessels grow in, and we're increasingly using MRA to demonstrate the ingrowth of vessels over time. Um, radiographically with angiogram, you can see that the selective external injection shows this great filling. And again, if you choose the kids carefully pre-op, I really think that they do well post-op. You do get this reversal of IV sign, as I mentioned, where, again, the sulcal brightness goes away. You can see it all in this whole hemisphere, the difference in blood flow. The stroke evidence, this white matter change, that doesn't go away because that's an infarct. But the IV sign in the sulci really does change. You can really see it very clearly here. And I think this has been a wonderful tool for us for post-operative follow-up, not only to see that the surgery worked, but also to see what areas may be getting new ischemia if they have a unilateral disease or posterior cerebral disease, for example. Um, we follow these kids, and what we've done is an angiogram at one year, at least for the unilateral patients. With bilateral, more and more we're getting away from the one-year post-op angiogram because we can get similar information with MR, and we don't put them to the risk of a post-op angiogram. We still do the pre-op angiogram, as I mentioned. We follow them for five years with annual MRIs, then at increased intervals every two to three years thereafter. We keep them on low-dose aspirin for life, the reason being that those tiny vessels are always there, and we want to improve flow through our graphs. Um, we have very few restrictions. At a 10-year follow-up, we had 147 patients under age 18. The reoperation rate was about 3.5%, um, mostly for anterior cerebral territory disease, and this is particularly in very young kids. Uh, about 13% had at least one TIA, so that's pretty common after surgery. And the stroke rate at 10 years is about 5.5%. So very minimally increased, probably similar to what you get in normal aging. We also looked at 20-year follow-up, and these kids do very well. Again, you can see just uh, this ingrowth of vessels, despite the natural moya moya getting worse. So you can see this got worse, but then we still had ingrowth. The flare sign, this IV sign, completely goes away. Um, you can see this ingrowth very clearly. Again, you see the IV sign vanishing. Um, and I think some of the take-homes here are that even over the long term, these kids do well. We get asked a lot about pregnancy in the older kids. Um, we have six patients um, that have had pregnancy after surgery from OMOA here within that window. Um, about half had vaginal deliveries, actually, so they don't all get C-sections. Um, all the treated hemispheres were protected. We did have one unilateral case that had a stroke on the non-operated side during delivery, um, probably because she uh, developed disease during that time had been lost for follow-up in between. We had an additional operation during the second trimester, so an actual pregnant woman who had progressive TIAs and strokes. With surgery, the symptoms went away in the mom, and the baby was delivered health, uh, healthy at term. Uh, parent, patients ask a lot about quality of life. Uh, just as an aside, we just published this a couple months ago, but in those kids with 20-year follow-up, uh, over 80% of them are independent uh, at the time of follow-up. Um, a lot of them will be educationally very fast outlet. 97% have high school degrees. Uh, almost uh, over half have college degrees. Um, and 40% will have advanced degrees. 80% are employed. They have jobs. Uh, and as mentioned, uh, people will have uh, babies of their own. So they really do very well, with the main factor being, what are they like when you treat them at surgery? Um, so with that, to wrap up here, uh, you know, people ask the question, you know, what really matters in Moya Moya? And I've talked about, I think, some of the important things of identifying affected subgroups, um, being very uh, codified in your surgical selection and how you treat the patients and having a evidence-based approach to surgical management. And so does this make a difference in outcomes? So we looked at uh, volume outcome relationships and the takeaway, as you might expect, is that experience matters. So when we looked at US populations in a national database, so this is a, an agnostic database. It's, it's, you know, it's not institution specific. Um, this is sort of blind data that is unbiased. And when we look at this high volume centers, uh, and uh, presumably this is us in Boston, <clears throat> unless there's some secret hospital there we don't know about, but in other groups around the country, the higher the volume you have, the shorter the length of stay. So high volume centers had a third less time in the hospital uh, when you were experienced. 
um, actually, despite what is assumed, at least in the U.S., for insurance costs, we're actually cheaper in the high volume centers, probably because there's a shorter length of stay and a lower complication rate, which means that it's almost 60% cheaper to go to a high volume center. Most importantly, an eightfold reduction in bad discharges when you're in a high volume center. So they're much more likely to go home than to go to rehabilitation or have a complication. And the death rate is almost 16 fold less at high volume centers compared to low volume. So I think what this suggests is that those of us that see kids with Moya Moya really should try to make sure they're high volume experience centers because it does change outcome. It changed costs, it changed length of stay, and most importantly, it changes how the kids do. Um, the take home here, I think, is for neurologists and physicians treating children, not just us as neurosurgeons. It is important to recognize the presence of arteriopathy specifically in these syndromic populations. And again, Moya Moya, for those in Asian uh, nations, you know, Japan, Korea, China, that awareness is high. But I think for those of us in the North American group, in Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, Africa, uh, Europe, there's this real importance to understand the syndromic population. We can really have an impact in improving the quality of life. And I think that surgical revascularization works and is helpful. Um, the last thing I'll say is that, you know, I'm not, I'm preaching to the choir here, but age matters. Kids are different than adults, both in biology and physiology. They present differently. They respond to surgery differently. Um, we really are at a great time in history now for understanding the genetics, the proteomic background of this disease in a way that we just haven't been able to do in the past, which is wonderful. Um, we are now starting to generate some evidence-based research with outcomes driving collaborative studies and, and, and I think really much better uh, methodologies to screen and treat these kids going forward. Surgery works and we're getting better at it. I think this is one of the rare fields in neurosurgery where we're really taking a biological process that the body does naturally and sort of uh, sort of flipping it into a, a therapeutic treatment. And, and I think we as surgeons uh, have a unique opportunity here to use our skills to save lives. Um, and lastly, the big hope is we can put ourselves out of business. I really think that this is a biologically based disease and my hope is that laboratory work in our lab and others around the world will ultimately lead to less invasive and more effective treatments with this. Uh, and this is where we can, as surgeons, lead at the forefront of translational medicine. And this kind of collaborative environment is so important. I want to compliment Naren for his excellent job in setting up these kind of talks. Um, I hope that this has been helpful a little bit in demonstrating uh, some of the things that uh, both I've learned from my colleagues around the world, it's been a pleasure to work with, and, and a little bit of what we're trying to do uh, here at Children's. So I think that's mostly what I wanted to cover. I think I did it within the time that I was given. So um, I will uh, sort of uh, stop my little sharing thing here, and then uh, if uh, Naren is in charge, I'll let him sort of figure out uh, if there's any questions or if there are things I can do to help. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh Edward, it was a fantastic lecture. We covered every angle and impressive results. And also, um, also, you looked at um, the outcomes and uh, nice to know that the indirect uh, uh, anastomosis is better. Um, I, I'm just going to open the floor to um, uh, the participants for questions. Uh, anyone has questions for Dr. Smith? Can I uh, ask one, uh, Narin? Sure, please, thanks. Uh, Dr. Smith, fantastic uh, talk, uh, a good update, and quite a few things that I'll take into my practice. My question is, you have a small proportion of uh, direct bypasses. How did you choose these uh, patients? And is there an age so, cutoff? Right, so the question is, uh, there's a small proportion with direct bypass. How did I choose them and was there an age cutoff? So Correct. great question. Um, in general, I reserve direct bypass for older patients. And I don't have an age cutoff. It's more the diameter of the STA. Um, and, you know, you probably want several millimeters at, at least. I think 0.7 or, or more is helpful for me. Um, but the big issue is you have to have a large enough artery. And the reason I would do it is if they were having non-stop repeated strokes that uh, were just unable to be arrested. 
And for those kids, if you say, gee, every couple of weeks they're continuing to have stroke after stroke after stroke, I think the direct bypass gets that blood flow to them when they need it most. Um, I've done this a few in some older kids with Down syndrome where they're almost adults, uh, but they've had this fast stroke progression. Um, the other population I'd love to do it in are little tiny babies. So we've published on the age two and younger, but I personally have a very challenging time doing direct bypass in infants. And while I would like to think that population would benefit from it, and I know Mike Lawton has published a paper looking at really, really young kids, um, I do find that, that those arteries are very difficult technically, and they tend to close off just because of the flow-related uh, you know, size of them. So the short answer is older kids with multiple recurrent strokes are my categories for direct bypass, if that answers the question. Thank you. Uh, Other Dr. questions? Professor Mandela, do you have a question? Yes. First of all, thank you very much for excellent and very complete lecture. And my question is, what is your opinion and, and if you ever used the so-called multiple bear hole technique for, uh, uh, for treatment of patients? So the question is, have I used the multi bear hole technique? And I, yes, you know, a number yes. of that I've heard it a lot from the Parisian group in particular, Dr. Blowburn and his, Professor Blowburn and his, and his population. Um, I would comment that um, I do think that the multi burr hole technique is probably more effective in infants and younger kids than older patients. Um, there are two answers to that. One is um, I think that in young children in particular, infants, they have a very thin skull. And the advantage there is if you have multiple burr holes, the scalp vessels and the meningeal vessels can grow in a little bit easier if it's a shallow hole. I think the problem that I've seen, and the, and the second answer is that Mike Scott and I looked at our series of patients, and Mike used to do the regular synangiosis on the side, and then we'll put a couple of burr holes up here for the anterior cerebral territory. And I think the issue is once you get over a couple of years old, just to drill a burr hole, you have a long, narrow cylinder um, as the skull gets thicker relative, you know, that the height is greater than the diameter. And I think the problem with that is it makes it very hard for blood vessels to grow down into the hole. And if you don't have a big disruption of the cortical surface with the arachnoid and the dura, it's hard for direct stuff. So I think that the, the burr holes probably work in the real young kids. I don't use them that often. Instead, what I find is if there's an area that's hard to reach like the anterior cerebral, if I don't have a good vessel or muscle, I find that rather than multiple tiny burr holes, a small crany where you can use pericranium or a little bit of muscle uh, with a better opening of the arachnoid and a better opening of the dura tends to re produce better results when we looked at that retrospectively. And again, I think there's, the reason simply is just the more surface area you have with a more shallow opportunity for blood vessels to grow in, I don't think blood vessels grow in very well down a straw. I think they grow in better over a large flat surface. So that would be my answer to that question, if that helps. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mary, can I ask uh, sure. another question? Yes, please, absolutely. Um, Dr. Speck, uh, what about salvage? So you have these patients who, you know, there's a proportion about 5% who have strokes on follow-up. Uh, when that happens, how do you investigate them and what's your salvage procedures? Right, so the question is, of the kids, if you have that 5% or so that get strokes after, how do you investigate them and what's the salvage procedure? So, um, you know, I would say that the first thing is we get all the kids who get a six month MRI and then a one year and thereafter MRIs. And so the first investigation is looking at MR and trying to determine if the strokes are in the territory that we revascularized, which would be a failure of surgery, or if the stroke was in a new territory, which would be a new surgery. Obviously, the easy answer is if, if it's in a different territory, posterior cerebral, it's forever, whatever, we would, if it looked like it was disease there, we would suggest surgery to that. So it's not really a salvage procedure as much as it's investigating a new territory. It's rare that we'll get new strokes in the same territory that we revascularized. If we do, it depends how severe it is. So obviously, if it's a great big stroke, you manage them supportively, and then sometimes there's not much left to save. Um, if it's a tiny stroke and it's within the six months after surgery, sometimes what I'll do is I'll just wait 
because uh, we'll increase the aspirin therapy or add Plavix, and the idea is that it may be that it just needs more time to grow in. If it truly fails, and we've done an STA or a, a bypass here, the salvage would be to put in a muscle flap, I, I, depending where the ischemia is. Uh, I love using a little um, temporalis muscle, which I find you can rotate to almost anywhere you need, and I'll use that to revascularize the area. So does that answer the question a little bit in terms of what we do and how we do it? Uh, it does, it does. Uh, just on the muscle, notice on your video, you didn't actually use muscle. Is there a specific reason for that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I'll use muscle, muscle on occasion. In general, I don't use it for a few reasons. First is, um, I think it adds a fair bit of bulk and some bleeding risk to the, to the brain. So this reduces the amount of tissue you have under the flap. I know in older kids, you can drill the bone a little bit to thin it out, and I've done that in uh, you know older kids where supplanted with muscle. Sometimes the craniofacial kids or the brain tumor kids, well, they don't have an artery because they've had a previous crany, so I you do use muscle there. Um, the second reason is, anecdotally, I think we've seen a slightly higher rate of seizure um, after muscle use versus artery or dura use. Um, and I suspect part of that is due to just the greater bulk pushing on the brain. But I also think that one of my fears is sewing it to the brain. We try to devascular, uh, de, uh, disconnect some of the muscle fibers so it doesn't tug on the brain when <clears throat> it contracts. Um, and I do think that increases the seizure risk a little bit. Um, so for those reasons, I tend to be a little more reticent about muscle use. Uh, although it, it works great, and um, I've certainly used it in a lot of cases, particularly where they've previously had surgery for other reasons like tumor or craniofacial, and we, need, we don't have an artery. Thank you. Thank you. Other right. questions? Other questions. While um, others are thinking of questions, just uh, following up from about the burr holes, um, would uh, putting the periosteum into the burr holes, do you think that would be helpful? Is that what you were... Uh, uh, alluding to, if in, in in older children, if they are, if you are making burr holes to get the blood vessels near to the dura. Yeah. So the question is, do we use pericranium in the burr holes? And the answer is yes. Um, again, um, my comment would be that I think pericranium can be a good sort of salvage vascular supply. You know, a number of other groups, including Stanford, have talked about using. Um, uh, uh, abdominal fat which is tunneled up under the skin uh, and you know a pedicled as a vascular supply to the brain I think any vascular tissue will be a good supply if the brain is hungry my comment is in general not only giving the brain a vascular supply whether it's pericranium muscle uh, you know stomach fat anything I think that the second issue is how that tissue is presented to the brain. And this is where I would comment that I think a wider, more open area will encourage more profuse growth. So again, pericranium is great, but I would comment that a small crany is probably gonna be a heck of a lot more effective than just a host of little itsy bitsy burr holes. The burr holes are, are easy and they work, and if you have a sick patient, that's fine. But my preference simply, I mean, you've seen this when you've done crannies for tumor or other stuff, you'll get more ingrowth when you've got a bigger surface area. Desi, Will, any questions? No. I've got another question, uh, Edward. Uh, I know that you do a lot of lab research, and my question is, um, whether you use or whether is there any angiogenic factors that you can put on the um, put on the um, when you do the, ana the indirect anastomosis to help with the um, uh, blood vessels growing across? Yeah. So the question is, do we use any angiogenic factors to supplement growth? Uh, and the answer is yes, if you are a mouse or a rat, uh, but no, if you're a human being as yet. So we are in the process of doing that. We've identified a number of uh, growth factors, particularly that we can identify in the urine uh, of uh, patients and, and rats. Uh, and um, the idea is that uh, we can uh, utilize these to jumpstart uh, the growth. The concern, obviously, is that the same things that promote blood vessel growth um, in a good way for moya moya can also theoretically promote tumor growth and promote sort of luxuriant 
vessel growth, which might increase the risk of hemorrhage. So this has been one of the impediments to just widespread use and not just sprinkling it on the brain because of the nonspecific effects of a lot of angiogenic peptides. So I think that enthusiasm is still there, but I think as we've gotten further along in the process of application, it's been tempered a little bit by the complexities of getting a very uh, therapeutic specific angiogenic growth as opposed to non-specific proliferation. Thank you very much. Um, any more questions? I have one question, my final question. Uh, you mentioned about low volume and high volume centers. And um, I think in U.S., many of the hospitals are private hospitals, so you, they have autonomy. In U.K., um, you know, most of the hospitals, all the hospitals, pediatric neurosurgery hospitals are government hospitals. So the, the problem with this high volume thing is that uh, then once again, you know, certain centers will get the cases if we go along that line, and it will obviously deprive other pediatric neurosurgeons of doing things. Do you see any collaborations? We have people from high volume center go to the low volume center and do uh, conjointly do operations, and so that way people don't lose out. Do you see um, any 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 midway between high and low volume so that both, both can operate? Right. So the question is, you know, with high volume centers, that obviously leads to this contentious. Uh, centralization of care and um, do we have any mechanisms for example of having a surgeon go to a lower volume center to help and the short answer is no not in the US and the reason is frankly the surgery is not that difficult here right I mean those of us you, you've all done them it, it, this is not like uh, I mean a direct bypass is a little more complex certainly indirect is not that hard of a case generally speaking and to be fair as much as we as, as neurosurgeons think we're the big bosses, really a lot of the management and the perioperative care is the anesthetic management, um, which is very important. The post-operative ICU care with tight blood pressure control, anti-nausea so they don't vomit and lower the blood pressure. So the point is that it's not just a surgeon taking a trip out to the suburbs to do an operation. It's all the coordinated care as the entire institute, which is ICU care, nursing care, anesthetic care, which is just impossible to pick up part and parcel and move to all, all the way around. It's this multidisciplinary long-term care that unfortunately or fortunately really advocates for centralization. It's contentious, surgeons don't like to hear it, uh, but if you look at the numbers and you look at the outcomes, it's, I think for these complicated rare diseases, it's kind of hard to make the case that these should be farmed out, at least from what we see here in the US. People do it, but I don't know that it's the right thing for the kids. Any other questions for Dr. Smith? If I could uh, just uh, expect on, when you have an unusual presentation, you have, uh, you know, ischemic stroke, it doesn't really fit in with a classical moi moi, you've got posterior circulation involvement. Uh, is there a battery of, uh, what do you, how do you investigate them? Or uh, is there a battery of genetic uh, assays or, that you do? Yeah. So the question is, if we have an unusual presentation like posterior circulation or, um, you know, something unusual, do we have other testing we do or genetic testing? So we have a neurovascular geneticist at Children's and we will often refer them for evaluation. The problem is there's such a limited number of genetic tests, right? I mean, we have maybe a dozen or so associated mutations that are known, not just the RNF213, but Gucci, um, NF1, et cetera. So we will refer them for evaluation to that. As I mentioned, um, one of the big helps on the MR is looking for dissection or inflammation. So we'll do the routine looking for inflammatory markers. You might do an LP to look for CSF markers. Um, and then I have found very helpful the vessel wall imaging on MR. So thin vessel wall imaging and cross-section along with, with contrast has been immensely helpful for identifying these weird inflammatory conditions uh, or dissection, which frankly are the biggest uh, curveballs in, in our practice here. So those are the types of things that we'll often throw in for evaluation that will help us distinguish the ones that might be in, good for surgical revascularization and those which are the ones which are best sat on for a little bit while we sort them out. Thank you. Thanks. Ricardo, do you have any questions? 
Dr. Sheikh, any questions? Uh, I'm just I'm just going to uh, do some housekeeping, and if any any of you have questions, you can ask at the end. Um, well, I'm going to send you a feedback form. I will be really grateful if you can please <coughs> it. It will be useful uh, in uh, taking these webinars forwards, as well as I'm sure Dr. Smith will appreciate um, that you uh, what you all th thought of his excellent presentation. The other thing is that I will email you in the next one to two weeks uh, certificates for attendance at this meeting. And uh, I hope that will be useful as well. And then the next one, I will let you know about the next one. It will be Mr. Tessi Rodriguez on craniosynostosis for May. So uh, so there, there were my housekeeping notes. Um, any questions from anyone else? Uh, I'm just, just so that Dr. Ricardo, Dr. Uh, Smith knows who asked the questions. It was uh, Dr. Atul Tiagi from Leeds. He's a senior pediatric neurosurgeon from Leeds. It's a busy unit. And also Professor Marek Mandera from um, from Poland. Um, so if, if, is there any questions? Uh, can I ask a question, please? Yeah, of course, of course. Sure, and then I got to get going after this. So uh, that, that you'll, you'll win out with the last one. So fire away. <laughs> Uh, okay, what is the size of the STA you, you keep for vascularization? Decide on. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. What, what, what did you ask? How, how do you decide on the size of the STA for revascularization? Correct revascularization. Oh. How to decide on the size of the STA for revascularization? The, the the fact of the matter is is that unless I'm planning a direct bypass, which as I mentioned is a very small minority of our cases, uh, it honestly doesn't really matter what the size of the STA is. And I've used the posterior auricular, I've used the frontal branch looping back, I've used the parietal branch. Most commonly, I'll use the parietal branch quite simply because it's anatomically where the disease is. Uh, I love it because it can come across the sylvian fissure. And I think one of the problems with the direct bypass is it often goes into the temporal lobe, but honestly, the most important area to protect is the frontal lobe. So, you know, folks will do a double barrel bypass, but that's a lot of extra work, a lot of extra time. We can do this surgery about an hour, an hour and 15 minutes. And so we can do both sides at the same operation, single anesthesia, um, and the size of the STA doesn't matter. And what we'll see is on post-operative imaging, it'll double or triple in size as it increases supply to the brain. I think you saw that in some of the MRs I showed uh, during the talk. So the short answer is size doesn't really matter, despite what you might hear in the movies, uh, but it does matter, unless you're doing a direct bypass. Thank you, thank you. All right. That's brilliant. All right. So um, just the last point you make is that the uh, presentation has been recorded. And uh, I will uh, send you the link so that you can review. Sometimes it's, uh, you know, I always find looking at a video twice, three times, I learn so much. So I will send you the link to the recording. Dr. Uh, Smith is happy for uh, his the recording to be viewed by uh, others. And once again, thank you very much. Uh, it really has been a fantastic session. I'm sure that you will agree with me. I really appreciate taking time on a Sunday to be with us. I hope you have also found it a rewarding experience. Aaron, you did a great job. Thank you so very much. And uh, you, you're really doing wonderfully with this. It's been a real honor and a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you to all the lecture folks. It was nice meeting you virtually and nice chatting with you. I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Thank you you too. Much. Thank you to right. everyone. Bye-bye. 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 Thanks.